All right, uh, so it's 12.03 by my clock, so I'm just gonna jump in. Um, so it looks like we have 31 participants, which is great. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce uh, Rebus and this, the Open Textbook Network office hours. Um, I'm just gonna run through the agenda here. Uh, Karen's gonna do an intro to the topic. Um, I'm from Rebus and Karen is from the Open Textbook Network. Um, now, oh, Maha, you're make, making me nervous about saying your name now after all that. But Maha, is that close? Maha Vali, who is um, in Egypt, is going to talk about things. Uh, Alan Harnam, who is in Toronto at the um, OCADU, will talk about some things. And Susan, I'm not sure where you're from, Susan. Where are you from? Uh, I'm in Victoria. I'm at Camosun College. Victoria, excellent. Uh, will join us as well and give some thoughts. Okay, so uh, just an overview for what this is, uh, what Rebus is. So Rebus is a um, building a community and platform for helping people create open textbooks and OER. Um, we started these open hours, office hours, just as a mechanism to get people together to talk about particular issues that we see popping up in um, open textbook production, publishing, creation questions. Um, we joined with the Open Textbook Network because they're great um, and doing lots of good work and it seemed to be very complementary to the stuff that we're doing to try to spread the, the um, burden of, of figuring out what we should be talking about. So again, the idea normally, the way these operate uh, we record them. We usually have three to four experts who are invited to talk about their perspective on a particular issue. Um, we try to keep those uh, expert talking pieces short to around five minutes if we can. Um, and then we open it up for discussion afterwards. Um, typically what we do is we have people type questions into the chat and then uh, the moderator will read them out just to, to make it a little bit easier to, to handle. Um, and really, again, the office hours here, we've done stuff on metadata, on uh, production workflows, on keeping textbooks up to date, uh, on lots of different things. This is an issue, I think, uh, that's a really critical one. So I'm going to hand it over to Karen to introduce it, but I think it's really important. I'm just going to editorialize a bit, but very important that as we think about all the wonderful things that open textbooks can do, thinking about accessibility, inclusive design, all these different things that we can do right with open textbooks that maybe are done less right in the commercial publishing universe, um, that uh, in thinking of inclusiveness in a very broad sense is something that um, we can do well in open textbooks and figuring, and maybe we're not doing as well as we ought to. And so thinking about this, um, is super important. Okay, sorry, I think I did too much editorializing. Karen, over to you to talk a bit more about the topic itself. Thank you, Hugh. So, hi everyone, I'm Karen Lauritsen, currently logged into Zoom as Dave Ernst, in case you're seeing that name there. Um, I'm with the Open Textbook Network. We're delighted to be co-hosting the monthly office hours with Rebus. Um, the Open Text Textbook Network, just as a quick overview, is a membership organization, um, really a community, and we focus on professional leadership development and open education programming. And we've been doing a lot of that work around adoption and are now also doing it in publishing. So um, as we continue bringing these conversations to you, I invite you to think about future topics that you may want to explore, past topics that you may want to revisit, if things occur to you during this conversation, please put them in the chat or email me sometime, email Liz, email Hugh. Um, we really want to talk about what you want to talk about. So today, um, I think we can all agree, we want to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in OER. And um, we thought a lot about this conversation and spent some time um, developing the description in terms of what we're going to talk about here. And really, we see this as an opportunity, an opportunity to leverage open ed values to create a vibrant publishing culture. So how do we do this? We'd really like to explore that question with you today and think about how we can work together to ensure that diverse 
voices are equally valued, and to look at what barriers may exist in open textbook publishing that could inhibit this vision. So um, when we sent out a, a description for this call today, Tara Robertson was going to join us. Unfortunately, she is unwell, but fortunately, um, we were able to find um, Alan Harnum, who will be um, talking uh, second today in our lineup. He's a senior inclusive developer at OCAD University. We were also here from Sue Donner, an instructional designer from Camosun College in BC, who works in universal design and is a developer with the BC Open Textbook Accessibility Toolkit. But first, we're going to hear from Maha Bali. She's an associate professor, professor of practice at the Center for Teaching, excuse me, Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. So each guest will talk for about five minutes, and then we'll spend the majority of our time um, talking together, asking questions, and exploring this topic. So Maha, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Karen Hugh. Thank you all for having me. And just listening to the titles that Alan and Sue have, I feel like they know a lot more about inclusion than I do. <laughs> they have it right in their titles, you know, Universal Design and Inclusive Developer. I want one of those in my campus, one of each of you. <laughs> um, so I, I often um, talk about inclusion from a post-colonial perspective, which I guess is, is where I come in here as a different person from this part of the world. I work at an American university, but it's still in Cairo. And so the values around Cairo are very different. We have half, about half of our faculty are American Canadian. And just the generic point um, that I'd like to make in general about equity and inclusion in OER is that there is, for the most part, there's nothing inherent about openness that automatically means that it will include everyone. A lot of the times the way it's defined is coming from a particular perspective and therefore when you then give that perspective to others, new issues will come up uh, that didn't seem like they would be exclusive or they would become barriers. A lot of them turn out to be that way. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use an analogy that I used in a recent keynote uh, that people took farther and I like the way they've taken it farther. And I said, you know, when you think about inclusion as, as, as giving everyone space at the table, you need to think beyond giving people space at the table that you've pre-designed. So you need to give people opportunities to design the table. You need to give them opportunity to decide what gets put on the table. You need to have everyone have opportunities to decide what the rules are for that table and how everything goes. And, and one of the things, for example, someone said, you know those high tables where people who are really short have difficulty just getting onto the table? You want to avoid that kind of thing. Uh, you want to avoid having something on the table that will turn people off. So I would get turned off, uh, for example, by having alcohol on the table. Little things like that. And so just taking that abstract idea and applying it to OERs, there's a couple of things that we talk about a lot in, in open education. Hi, Christina. In, <laughs> in open education uh, that, that turn off people that we, and we don't expect that would happen. So I, I think, for example, I've, I'm working with Rebus on an open textbook uh, related to, to music. And we've had a lot of struggles with choices of licenses because the funding comes for CC BY. And there are parts, because it's a music textbook, there are parts of this book that are by musicians that they're not okay with people using commercially, or they're not okay with people taking derivatives of. And finally, we were able to reach a point where parts of the book will be on a non-CC by license, but the rest of it will be. But the point is that Zoe was very, you know, very patient. We spent a lot of time discussing that kind of thing. And there's just this, this whole direction in open ed that if you're not CC by, then there's something wrong with you. And I think that we need to understand the different contexts of people. We need to understand that in parts of, especially my parts of the world, so these musicians aren't all from this part of the world, but in my part of the world, there's a lot of plagiarism and there's a lot of people who take things and pretend they are theirs. So something like CC0 would be a disaster because someone wouldn't just take your stuff, they would take it and pretend they would, it was theirs and then copyright it, you know what I mean? And this has happened in history outside of my part of the world too, but that kind of fear exists. And another thing that, that we also always need to keep in mind is that a lot of things that we call open require a lot of background to be able to have the power to do. So to be able, so I mean, just start with open source, uh, which is often touted as like the most open thing, is that it requires technical knowledge of programming. So just because a software is open source doesn't mean that every single person will be able to, to change it to the way they want it to be. 
And also it's a, it's a computer science culture, so it's a very male culture. And I, I'm, I used to be a, a computer scientist who ran away because of that very masculine culture. Um, things like domain of one's own, which is touted again as, a, as one of the biggest things about open, which I love that project, but it means someone has to pay for a domain and a lot of young people in Egypt don't have credit cards. So that option isn't even on the table and trying to think of would it make sense to do it in college if students won't be able to pay for it later has, is, is one of the things I've struggled with a lot. And something that often when I talk to people in America about, they haven't, they, it takes them a very long time to figure out why this is the barrier for us. So uh, that's what I have to begin with. Uh, I'm looking forward to listening to what Alan and Tav and to all your questions and comments. All right, thank you. I think um, uh, the, the, yeah, the point of having these conversations is to be thinking about that. How do we open the way we're asking these questions about um, inclusiveness and equity, et cetera. So great perspectives, thank you. Um, over to you, Alan. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so just to give slightly more, um, so I work, uh, I work at OCAD University, but I specifically work for the Inclusive Design Research Center there as a, uh, as a senior inclusive developer. Um, and I think this, uh, many of you probably know our director, Yuta Treviranus, who is much better known in this community than I am. And I sort of, um, I went through and scrolled down a few thoughts on the topic that, that I have and that I think are framed within the context of the kind of work we do here at the IDRC. But uh, Maha, I thought that was a fantastic introduction. And I'm, I'm really, it's, uh, it's great to hear someone thinking from, I think, the post-colonial perspective on these issues of openness and inclusion. So that's awesome. Um, I'm really curious about your perspective on this. So this is going to be a little bit scattered um, because I'm a somewhat scattered person in my personality. But so I think that there's um, I wrote down a couple of things. One of the things is around the question of increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, and OER publishing. And I think one of my thoughts on this, and this is some of the work that we do on the IDRC, is from a technical perspective, which is just looking at practicalities of revision of the tool stack for authoring and publishing. Um, some of the focus that we do at the IDRC is around um, looking at tools that exist for authoring, for consumption, and for remixing, and trying to get things improved at various points in the tool stack from the authoring perspective. You know, how do we create tooling that gives um, first class citizenship to alternate ways of creation? Um, you know, things that work from a perspective of, for example, voice recording for OERs. We're doing a bunch of things right now with um, transcription of voice that are that are quite interesting. Uh, and then along that chain to publication, how do we make sure that we have publication tools that create um, resources that can be consumed by the widest possible audience? And that includes both, I think, traditional considerations of accessibility the web content accessibility guidelines, alternatives to images, and also things in our research that are a little more um, a little more out there. Like we do experimentation on um, production of infographics that can be sonified or turned into touch graphics as well. So we're really interested these days in multimodal authoring and multimodal publishing. Um, we're also starting to get. Um, I'm starting. I, and this has come up from some conversations with people I've worked with who are um, uh, far, uh, Farsi speakers, for example, which is looking at doing design of reusable components that can be easily internationalized or, easily, or more easily turned into right to left orientation um, and kind of making multilingual localization of first class citizen of these, these production frameworks and consumption frameworks. Um, so that, that sounds a bit technocratic, um, which I'm, I'm fairly conscious of. And I think the other thing that I'm really interested in that we're, we're getting more and more interested in here is looking at supporting remixing of content as a first class citizen, many tools and looking at things that erase the boundary between kind of like the idea that there's an author and a consumer, because those paradigms themselves are the paradigms of traditional publishing um, structures. 
what would it look like to have tools that made the ability to remix a first class citizen and what would support of that paradigm look like? Um, the other thing from that, and this goes into thinking about what the barriers are, which is I, I, I'm really interested in critical thinking about the culture around RUR production and consumption. How do things get co-opted? How do we find open movements replicating issues from other publishing domains, including the traditional structures of power and authority? And I thought, um, Maha, what you said about open source software production and kind of like the extreme white maleness of it was absolutely dead on because that's one of the things about so many of these open movements, which is the participation in them and particularly um, the preeminence with them replicates tra traditional power structures. And I think that needs to be continually interrogated um, and undermined. Let's see the other I think a lot of a lot of my thinking about this has come from reading things yeah. recently by Mike um, Caulfield about um, the way that we we replicate structures of production thinking like he had a really great line about blog post from a couple of years years ago that I'll quote here which is um, what if the OER community saw the creation of materials as a commodity but the reuse as an art and I think that that's an, an inversion of the way a lot of um, these things are structured, which is what gets valorized is the creation of materials. And we don't hear a lot about what happens to these materials after their creation. We, they go out there somewhere, who uses them, who remixes them. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's sort of the thoughts that I have as I said, a little bit, a little bit scattered. Awesome. Th thank you, Alan. Um, so again, we'll have a good amount of time to chat about all this stuff in a minute. Um, so I'm going to hand the mic over to Sue, uh, Donna to talk about her perspectives. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, uh, I'm coming to this discussion from the perspective of an instructional designer uh, and who's deeply invested in accessibility and universal design for learning as a framework for supporting inclusiveness in online learning. Um, I think for me, my first impression of an educational resource now that is published under proprietary framework is that not only is someone laying proprietary claim to the knowledge it contains, but also that this resource was probably produced by a closed circle of developers with a limited range of views and backgrounds, perspectives, disciplines, etc. Um, so metaphorically, um, a proprietary educational resource for me is sort of like a tiny little nation state uh, in that it's defined by a relatively homogenous population and it contains, you know, one as opposed to several nationalities. Uh, it doesn't convey input from a more diverse population. And I think a real weakness with the model of a nation state as far as um, aspirations for diversity and inclusiveness are concerned uh, is that it's a monoculture with little cross pollination and it's based on limited perspectives and therefore also limited assumptions about who comprises the student audience. Um, it's less likely to give rise to inclusive and innovative ideas than inevitably follow. I think when knowledge is shared openly and different perspectives and worldviews are incorporated. Um, so maybe it's an overly simplistic view of cause and effect, but if an educational resource doesn't include input from a diversity of stakeholders and knowledge holders, then what chance does it have to grow into something that is inclusive and relevant to a diverse population of students? Um, given, for me, again, given the real uh, and value added option of open my default impressions of proprietary resources now are that they represent a potential risk to diversity and inclusion and they leave a lot on the table as far as real opportunities for nurturing diversity and inclusiveness and practices go. Um, sort of as a, again, another sort of metaphorical tie in for me, maybe it's more than metaphorically akin, um, but uh, an educational resource that that ignores the diversity of the students who will be their uh, consumers and doesn't invite input from voices with different worldviews and perspectives, et cetera, uh, is akin to those, um, I saw a post recently, that's why it's on my mind, um, those, those biased algorithms that result in like the mass production of automatic soap dispensers that only work on Caucasian skin tones. Um, so I don't think it's a radical idea to suggest that ideally the default setting for all of us in post-secondary uh, should be open and we should look to open options as much as possible 
when we're selecting and do as much of our educational resources work in the open as possible. And if we do select or cre and create or publish uh, educational resources under some sort of proprietary frame framework, I think we should probably explain that choice, including why are we not open to sharing those resources beyond our, our little silos or nation states? And why are we not open to seeing our work adapted and adopted by a more diverse community than exists in our little cloistered um, institutions? And as part of that, um, pause to consider what opportunities we have missed. Um, as a small illustrative example from my own experience, and I, I'm sorry Tara is not here because we shared part of this together. Um, a few years ago, I developed um, a series of these little sort of checkpoint guides for faculty at my college, which were designed to help them create and produce accessible content in their online courses. And as, as educational resources go, they're pretty typical as how to best practice guides that instructional designers create. Um, and while I published them under a, a CCBY uh, license, they were still created within the sort of fixed confines of my own college and for a specific audience. Um, and they might never have evolved further than that. That might have been as far as they went, except that then I was invited into a collaboration uh, to create the BC Open uh, Textbook Accessibility Toolkit, and that widened the circle of input with uh, Amanda Coolidge from BC Campus, who brought an enormous wealth of, of knowledge about open and Tara who at that time was still with Caper BC uh, and brought an enormous um, uh, and fierce commitment to and expertise to alternate formats and students with print di uh, print based disabilities uh, and through Tara the circle widened further and we had student stakeholders involved in in the development of that resource we also benefited from uh, uh, some women who generously uh, made uh, persona images available in the open that they had developed for uh, a UX book, uh, Web for Everyone. So we published that toolkit in, in CCBY as well. And again, that might have been as far as it went, but then it was picked up and, uh, and adapted and a French version was created by a group of librarians in Ontario. Uh, and then a few of us created a derivative product out of the toolkit that uh, is an interactive workshop activity to elevate people's understanding of universal design for learning and accessibility in courses. Uh, and just this past summer, UBC adopted and adapted the toolkit for purposes of, of focusing their faculty and, and developing accessible open educational resources. So, um, this is like one small little example, um, but I think it, it's, it illustrates how OER is this natural and organic vehicle for collaboration and how the culture of, of open invites a diversity of input and supports uh, diversity in a learning community. Um, and, and in my case, I mean, I don't, I just don't remember that kind of uh, trajectory of, of inclusiveness and the widening, ever widening of the circle happening before open. Um, on those days when, when you're kind of desperate for a good news story, I think, I think an OER um, has the, the possibility, if it's collaboratively developed, um, to be a tiny little good news story. <laughs> awesome. Um, it's kind of nice to have the, the range of um, uh, comments here from Maha through, you know, a, a, from a very different perspective than most of us. Alan uh, talking about the abstract and then Sue really in the practical sort of what happens when things um, actually get published and what open can mean in that context. Um, so I recognize, so thank you, uh, the three of you. We're now going to open this for questions and comments. And I would just like to make an official recognition of the irony of a white guy sort of computery dude who's going to be the gatekeeper for comments here. I'm also going to make an extra effort to keep my mouth shut as much as possible in this because I like to talk about things, but um, uh, would like to really open this up to, to everyone else who's here. So um, I don't see any questions yet in the sidebar. So um, I think they, this was a wide range of things we were talking about, but um, Again, to keep the white male yakking to a minimum, someone better pipe up and, and <laughs> ask some questions. Um, uh, 
Um, this is Esperanza. I don't have a question per se, but just a, a comment that uh, the work that you, you the, and tools that you guys have shared uh, fit very well with an organization that I, I'm part of called NAEP, uh, National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. They would be very interested in knowing about the work that you're doing from an OER perspective to facilitate inclusion because that is a major focus of the organization. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, I put the website in the, uh, in the chat window. And uh, they are always looking for individuals to do webinars much like what you're doing here. You would fit right in with the work that they're doing. And they host an annual conference uh, and they uh, solicit presentations and um, during that uh, during that annual summit and uh, this is uh, this is probably a perspective that they have not ventured into which is very important especially when we're dealing on a college you know on the college level where we're trying to impact the success of students by reducing the cost so this is uh this is a very very important topic that needs to be you know shared with as many people and as wide an audience as possible and uh i serve on their executive committee so i invite you to go out to their website and take a look and if you find it engaging and interesting uh um let me know i can try to help you get uh you know get your foot in that door because yeah. It's wor definitely worthwhile. That's uh, awesome. I, I think, again, what one of the powers of this little event we do is, uh, is monthly is just trying to get these connections between people. So I think that's great. And I know that the Rebus team will be taking a look closely at that. Um, it's a question here from Margaret about converting books that are already published at OpenStax um, or new projects. I wonder if someone could kind of take that. Uh, so from Reber's perspective, we help with both. Um, but I wonder if someone could talk about kind of the, the uh, diversity and inclusive approach to adapting books, if anyone's um, done that, versus creating a new book and sort of thoughts on authorship versus conversion or, or um, adaptation. And if no one wants to take that, uh, there's another uh, comment here from Mark, which I think is really pertinent, which is um, a, a lot of open education creation stuff is coming from grant money of various kinds. And I wonder if anyone has any perspective on how we can help granting agencies get better at thinking about these issues of diversity and um, inclusion. I'm just going to say something really quickly. I, I think I'm not really sure what your question exactly was, but um, if you like, I'm just going to mention how I got into doing an open textbook because Hugh McGuire sat next to me at OER 17 and started to ask me why there weren't any Egyptians <laughs> doing open textbooks. And he reached out to me and we had a meeting just to explore why this was the case. And from that meeting came the idea that, well, we have an American faculty member at AUC who might be willing to start, and that would be a start for us, like a bridge, sort of. Um, I was just looking at the link that uh, Karen put in the chat about Hewlett and their uh, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm not that thrilled with it. <laughs> so, um, because it's very nonspecific. I'm not really sure... I haven't met anyone from, I, don't, I haven't met everyone at Rebus, but everyone I've met is white. So I'm not really sure how that's working out for you guys. Um, Apoorva, wave your hand. <laughs> um, so do you mean Hewlett or, or uh, Rebus? No, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know anyone from Hewlett. I know that they fund Rebus. <laughs> but I would assume that, they, but hi Apoorva. <laughs> Maha, you're right. I mean, I think you're touching on you know, 
different ways DEI is playing out both in internal organizations that Hewlett supports in terms of staffing. Your point is well taken and um, I see the same thing when I go to, you know, conferences and work with my open ed colleagues. And so I think, you know, that's, a, that's another conversation that fits here is how do we do a better job recruiting? How do we put money and resources behind these objectives? Um, and these same questions apply to authors. Um, how do we, you know, that, that's a sort of practical question I would love to explore in this call is how do we recruit diverse voices? You know, how do we make sure that we're not sort of repeating, um, as Alan and a couple of you talked about earlier, repeating the traditional processes in terms of finding authors for textbooks? Um, I'm really interested in, in thinking about how to um, find these other voices rather than just sort of repeating um, traditional structures. And related to that, I wonder, um, or maybe this is a separate question, how questions of open pedagogy can fit into this conversation um, and what that could look like. I'd like to contribute, if I could, a little bit. Um, I'm Vera Kennedy, and I started working with OER in about 2013. I was one of the early adopters of the OpenStax. I teach sociology. And uh, here at our campus, our adjuncts, we kind of did a peer review of the text and decided to adopt it. And we've been revising and retooling it, um, making it more um, applicable and easier to use, accessible for our students in the Canvas uh, learning management system. But in that effort, there was a point where we have another course within our discipline and it's nationwide. And it's a social problems course. And the tendency is a lot of colleges have wanted to make this a GE class in their area A, so it count as critical thinking. But all the commercial textbooks are focusing on social problems. They don't really integrate critical thinking. So early on when I first started working with OER, I saw where I saw some place I could contribute. And I was really interested in developing a text that integrated both disciplines so that it could be adopted and used it. And since I had been working with OpenStax, I was one of their early adopters, they knew who I was. And I approached them about help and assistance in publishing an OER for critical thinking social problems. And the feedback I got was, it's not a high enrollment course, we're not interested. And so I asked, well, who else is out there that might help me do this? You know, this is before we've had the mass movement, the mass rush in the last couple of years. And I was really discouraged, all the feedback that I got from a number of people that I talked to because it was a low enrollment course, even though all everyone who teaches sociology, this is one of the primary social courses, but considered overall in a college or university, it's not a high enrolled course. Everyone said, go with a commercial publisher. And so um, with feedback like that, I was very discouraged. I went ahead and did it you know, in hopes that eventually I'll be able to obtain the rights back and make it truly what I wanted it to be. Um, several of us that are involved, we are donating, you know, the income we receive from it back to our colleges um, because that was kind of the effort that we, the model we wanted to instill when we were developing it. But with messages out there like that, that the course isn't significant enough to impact a large number of students, um, it, it, we really get like mixed messages. So I was discouraged not as just a minority because my co-authors were also minorities and we're trying to add a new perspective to the discipline. I was discouraged in that way, but I was also just discouraged in general that there hasn't been a lot of um, encouragement or support and not just financially, but just in sentiment, you know, which really would help um, wants you to overcome some of the obstacles of doing something or learning or going through the, the learning curve of developing something without the resources. So I just wanted to kind of share my feedback and I don't, I don't know what to say other than that, but I'm hoping that this and other um, discussions will lead to more, um, I should say, a more positive environment, encouraging environment. So faculty don't get discouraged and go other options and make it more difficult then for us to contribute the way that we know the materials need to be developed and out there. Thanks. <laughs> That's um, awesome perspective. And I think Samantha's commented a couple of times here, which I think is relevant to this uh, saying that, you know, 
one of the issues is that there's in, inequity in full-time and part-time faculty in terms of diversity, et cetera. And there's a worry here about taking advantage of part-time faculty members. Um, and then she had another, um, This idea that um, adding diverse perspectives to OER um, sometimes get caught in this in this quality language, um, which is kind of coded for maybe those kinds of issues. I wonder if someone uh, wants to to address those kind of issues of sort of the systematic biases that I think Maha was was pointing out that you know there's a lot of systematic biases and just saying open is going to help us solve this without being really intentional about it means it won't get solved in any more interesting way than the rest of the universe does. So I wonder if someone could take on some thoughts about that intentionality. Yeah. And Hugh, I'd actually like to add on to that and, and try to incorporate Vera's story because I think the open ed community and the way we've been framing our work um, is somewhat guilty in contributing to this, right? If, if part of what we're celebrating is, enormous cost savings, then where does that leave classes that maybe don't have high enrollments? Um, and so I think that's one of the tensions um, in our community that we could talk about now too, along with this, this question of, you know, involving students and then, oh, we're already worried about what people are saying about quality, but what does that say about students if we're worried about their quality? I mean, these things get really um, very layered. I was thinking about something, and I'm trying to remember if it was Rajiv Janyani who says who did this research, or Sukaina Walji from South Africa, or both of them doing it together. I think they were researching what happens to OERs, and one of the the key things, and I think Sue gave a really good example of this, as culturally centric as anything else, but because it's OER, because people can adapt it then it can grow into something that's more inclusive and diverse. Um, but they were saying in their research that the majority of OERs didn't get remixed. And I was asking them, so why didn't they get remixed? Didn't they not get remixed because people didn't have the technical ability to remix them? Or what was the reason? I think these are things that we need to interrogate. So, I mean, Sue was saying we celebrate the creation of the OER, but then what happens to it after that? The fact that we made it um, open to adapting how often does it get adapted? How, how does that happen? And who has the skills and, and the power to do that kind of thing? Who has the time as a faculty member to do that kind of thing? I'm really lucky that I'm, I have a lot of access to a lot of resources related to what I'm teaching this semester. And I pick bits and pieces from things from New Zealand and things from Ireland, and I put them all together and give them to the students. But how often can people do that? Um, and so that's, that's one of the things. And the other thing is anything where you say we're seeking people, we're trying to find people, you're trying to find people to, to do something that you've already designed. And maybe you've designed it in a way that doesn't welcome them or doesn't meet their needs. And so you need to go back a step um, and find them and then ask them what, what it is they need before you tell them this is what I have to offer. I think that's... Um Thumbs up from over here. Uh, there's a, a, a comment here from uh, Christina who's answering uh, Samantha, talking about the, the, how we define quality and that there's coded into that. It means uh, anything that is outside of how we're already doing things is defined as low quality. I wonder if someone wants to take that quality question on um, with some comments. Christina, do you want to jump in and talk about it if your audio is able to do that? Uh, sure. I, I'm, honestly, I, I don't have any really deep things to say beyond, <laughs> beyond that. But um, the thought was, uh, I, I hear this sometimes in the grapevine about people who say, well, you know, we are just aren't quite as good a quality. And partly, I think, Samantha's point about including student students in there would play into that but partly it's not just this is how we normally do it in the discipline but it's also oh those things are created by people at other universities who are not as good as our university right i mean we sometimes hear that even if it's not said in that way exactly um which is you know ridiculous but then I was also thinking, I haven't heard this exactly, but I can imagine someone looking at, a, at an open 
resource and saying, well, I'm in philosophy and them saying, that's not exactly the way we do philosophy. That's not the, you know, kind of normal philosophical content or approach. Um, so therefore it is low quality. So I was just thinking there's a lot of things that go into that quality. And, and Samantha said, yeah, she was trying to get lots of those things too. <laughs> Yeah, there's a note here from Vera talking about peer review um, as a as a mechanism to vet quality um, of OER. Um, but I, I think all this, like a lot of this, comes back to this question of of how do we, as a community, make sure that we don't start reinforcing the things that we're trying to improve on. Um, And uh, yeah, so again, Samantha echoing back here, the pushback is that this isn't what I normally teach. So, so it's not quality and this kind of, you know, the, the power of open in theory to provide different perspectives. But if everyone says, well, that perspective isn't what I normally teach, then, then what happens? And again, how do we build as a community these intentions to push these boundaries when you know, funding says, okay, what's the biggest enrollment and how do we produce generic stuff that is going to go into big enrollment classes? How do we make sure that our community has space for this other stuff intentionally? Um, I, don't, I don't know, Samantha, I don't know if you can pop on. You've got, had a, lot, a ton of really good comments here. I don't know if you want to pop on and um, talk about this, talking about peer review being used as, as a mechanism to shut down conversation and different perspectives, which I think is really interesting. Sure, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, um, what I've seen just internally at my institution in terms of um, running uh, the grant that I'm working on, which is a, a Z degree, is I've seen people who have taken the risk to pull in open materials and to develop materials and groups that have worked together and then there's this conversation about, oh, well, we all, the discipline has to review it. And then the pieces that don't fit are, are oh, that doesn't really work. We're going to take that piece out. Let's edit that piece out. Let's edit that piece out. And so it might be, you know, a perspective of on, you know, and I teach literature and composition and rhetoric. And it, it may be a conversation about, um, you know, a, a different theoretical approach to analyzing literature or something like that, or a different theory on the way or a different idea about how something has been analyzed um, or taking it from a different character's perspective or whatever, and then it's shut out. And interestingly, to Vera's conversation that's happened a little bit in our sociology area as well, that question of, well, we don't talk about those pieces of this in this course, and that's not the way that we approach this, is that this text isn't any good, therefore we need to, to shunt it aside. Um, and so there's been a lot of shutdown. And sometimes that does seem to be when the person who's presenting it is diverse or, you know, isn't is, it, is a newer faculty member and excited and also happens to be diverse. And so they don't have the standing or the, 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 the expertise or the, what, they have the expertise, they don't have the prestige in the department to be able to push back. And so they often will shut themselves down. So it's not even necessarily a direct shutdown. It's a subtle message to where, okay, I'm just going to do my thing over here in my own class but I'm not gonna share that out with other people. I don't know, that's sort of disjointed, but those are some of the things that I've seen happening here. here. So. Awesome. Um, yeah, uh, Jonathan's got a point here, uh, just kind of a, 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 a talking about the free software and open source software movement and, and how do we sort of try in our community to take the good things of that universe and and try to avoid some of the bad things. Um, I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to pop, pop on and just talk a little bit about some of the bad things that we might want to avoid. Or can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I, 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 I've, I'm, I mean, so, uh, I mean, I've written a couple of books that I put on my website with a CC by license and I, I use them in my classes and things. I very much a you know, in the classroom perspective on this thing, but I, I find as someone who wants to share things that it's very often, and I, I come, I'm a mathematician, I come from the 
floss world pretty much and it's a little bit bizarre to me people are always talking about how wonderful you know how we can remix to to add new perspectives and things but then you go to the open textbook library or open stacks or the more popular sources for OERs and they're in they're a PDF right you know remixing a PDF is a nightmare um, and so you know if I just so it seems like I, comparing it to the floss world where you know everything's on github i mean i don't use github but i post my books i i put them in i put all of the source files on my website with the little image the pngs for the images and the, all the different pieces and, and a detailed explanation of how to recreate the or adapt as you wish and i i oddly in the oer community although we give an enormous amount of lip service to the remixing is a vital part of what oer is we don't seem to enable it um, whereas instead we seem to be trying to replicate um, kind of commercial publishing models. You know, open, open stacks books look, look like the commercial publishing books. Um, and that actually turns me off about them. But I th then I think, sorry, so again, we want to go, I, I wanted to start a comment about, you know, we, we really need to go to that model. But Maha made a really good point that, that, you know, it's all white men. I mean, look at me. And, you know, that are that are doing this and that, you know, look at the Google engineer who got, you know, who, who mouthed off about this. Uh, I think we have to have a figure out a way to be more inclusive, and I, I want. I would like to hear Maha's point of view on, um, you know, how can we move in that direction? I mean, you know, the, she made a point about how you need technical knowledge to be able to successfully contribute, and I don't don't sort of know how to answer that objection. I have I, I have a recent experience, just coincidentally, that kind of helps this question. I've been uh, editing Wikipedia on and off for a few years now, maybe 10 years, very little. And I'm a computer scientist, so I was comfortable with the syntax of whatever I had to work students just last week. And they have a visual editor now. And so my students were able to edit Wikipedia like this. And that little change makes all the difference. So now the person doesn't have to focus too much on what the syntax is to create a link and so on. They could just go ahead and, and just use the visual editor, which looks like Microsoft Word or like WordPress visual editor. And those little things, oh, I'm in the middle of a conversation, baby. So that's one of the things that it's, it's, we have the technical, it's doable. Like you, you lower that barrier, that automatically helps. But of course, Wikipedia has all kinds of other issues, right? Again, with the white male culture and all that. And finally enough, the actual Wikipedia page about Wikipedia has a section on sexism that's this small that says how vicious it is in that two sentences. It's just crazy. But um, on the other hand, the oh, Arabic Wikipedia is much more, um, more, more comfortable for people to edit, for example. So it's, it's like it's a safer space for them to start if they wanted to before they moved on to the English Wikipedia, where there's maybe fewer arguments and there are, we know the editors so they can help us out if something's wrong but also the editors came in to give us that workshop explaining to us what you shouldn't do to get your article removed from Wikipedia and they showed us why an article gets removed and those kinds of things if people can get that information and know about it and then they wouldn't get that disappointment of not being able to work on it. does that help a little bit so you're saying that the technical obstacle has a sort of a technical solution we can do a better job we can make more WYSIWYG and GUIs and things and that will help the technical things. I'm. It, I'm not sure. I. I could understand exactly how you want, how you how you think we can make more diverse voices and less white male privilege and so on. You know, come for. You know, it seems like it's a cultural difference. You know, the Arabic Wikipedia is better about this, and it's a. You know, it's a different culture that's contributing to that version of Wikipedia. So you're. So we have to build a culture in OER in white dominated universities in the United States and in all over the world um, to to help build that is that is that what you're suggesting um, so I, the the technical solution to the technical okay. problem I think is a beginning right at least because that, then there was no that, that then they may they may not have ever done it or they would have decided not to do it again and be on the class so that just is a first step I think to access um, the other the other issues I think is recognizing them and then figuring out what to do. I haven't found the answer to that. I'm still, like, my students want to edit in English, and I'm really concerned, because I've tried editing stuff and getting it completely removed, and I know that's fine. But I think also trying, well, first of all, they don't have a lot of room. They don't have a lot of room to decide about Wikipedia's rules. They, are, they already exist. So the table is not theirs. They don't have a choice. But at least they, making the rules transparent helps them make a difference for that thing. Um, I think one of the issues, I'm just thinking because someone was talking, I think it was Alan who talked about Mike Caulfield's work, and Mike Caulfield has this alternative FedWiki um, 
Do you know what Federated Wiki, how Federated Wiki works? So it's not like Wikipedia where there's one final article that everybody sees. Federated Wiki allows different people to take anything and edit it, and there will be different versions of it all over the place. And that sort of removes the problem of the hegemonic democracy type of thing that Wikipedia is, but it creates a, a separate thing, which, yes, of course, okay, so there are five different versions of this article, but which one is the one that's getting read? And it's probably by the most famous person who wrote it, and the people who are less famous don't get read. If it's written in English um, and the other person writes it in another language, that one's not going to get read. Uh, I don't have a solution. I'm just breaking it all up and I'm not being very constructive. <laughs> but I think there are small steps in different directions that sort of um, go towards helping a little bit. I do think with, um, I don't know, with the, with the open source community, I, I don't even know where to start. But I do think you're right that there are certain aspects of it that are good. I'm just not okay with people celebrating it as if there was nothing wrong with it. And if we took it all, we'd be all very happy. Thank you for that conversation. So Hugh had to leave. And so um, we are left here together to sort of wrap up and reflect on our conversation so far. In terms of what I've heard, it seems like we could have this conversation within a lot of different contexts. For example, we could talk about DEI in terms of technical considerations. We could talk about it in terms of how we approach remix opportunities. We could talk about it in how we reflect on the lack of time in all of our lives in both creation and remixing, and is there a way that we can influence tenure and promotion and, and sort of trying to create time where it feels none exists. That's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's the opportunity to think about how we can do it better, not reproduce existing structures, and learn to sort of step back from the table, as Maha um, sort of metaphorically described early on in this call, and think about how the table is designed, who put that table there, what it looks like, and if we need to sort of uh, build it another way. And then also I heard um, perhaps opportunities for peer review conversations. Um, and opportunities in this process. And I'm sure there's things that I missed. So um, in our next couple minutes, I would love to hear from both our guests and for all of you who could join us, you know, if any of those topics sound like something you would like to explore further, um, other ideas for future conversations, um, closing thoughts, gratitude for our guests. Um, I hand it over to you guys. Uh, I might jump in briefly uh, from the Rebus perspective. So those of you who haven't met me before, I'm the project and product manager at Rebus. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who's contributed to the, to the conversation today. Part of our job is building a table in a way. Uh, so we, we have been thinking about this and processing it and there's always more to think about and process. Uh, so it's so valuable to hear from, uh, from everybody here to, to know what we need to be thinking about because we we've talked about it previously in terms of accessibility specifically. We need to build these things in from the start. Um, you know, however much we can do right now as we're putting something together rather than trying to retrofit it later, uh, I think is really important. Um, so thank you. Uh, for, for your thoughts and we will be following up in various ways. This is not the end of this. Great to see you, Zoe. Okay, um, I see comments in the chat. This is super, thank you. Discussion about peer review, open pedagogy. Christina's blog post, which we're all gonna um, look forward to reading. Ethan, hello. Um, Ethan's coordinating a panel at Open Ed on equity and diversity in OER. So um, perhaps we can see each other, um, for those of us who are attending, live in the same room, which would be great. All right, well, we've come to the end of our hour. Um, Comments are still coming in. I don't mean to um, cut anyone off, but I want to be sensitive of time. We have about three minutes left. Um, we will be sure to um, look through your comments and find future topics. Um, we really appreciate uh, the community informing what we talk about. Um, we, we need you guys, obviously. And um, I would like to thank again our guests.
Mahabali, Alan Harnum, and Sue Donner, thank you very much for contributing your expertise and perspectives and look forward to meeting again in the future. Thanks everyone for coming to the Rebus Open Textbook Network office hours. <laughs>